Why, why such a personal letter addressed to, you know, for the whole church? Why, why a personal letter between a slave owner named Philemon and his runaway slave named Onesimus? Why is that in your Bible? Like I said, there's a backstory to Philemon, and we have to know that in order to make sense out of this, all right? So here's how Colossians and Philemon go together, and here's the backstory to, uh, to Philemon. Um, the Philemon is a wealthy landowner in the city of Colossae. It is his house in which the Colossian church meets. He's one of the wealthy people who has a big enough house where a group of 40 or 50 people can gather to do church. And so they're meeting at Philemon's house. Um, and uh, Philemon has a slave by the name of Onesimus. And Onesimus, his slave, has run away. So Philemon is a slave owner in Colossae. Um, and one of his slaves, Onesimus, has run away. Now, we don't know exactly why Onesimus ran away, but somehow in running away, he went all the way to where Paul was. We don't know exactly where Paul is, probably Rome. Uh, he went to where Paul was and somehow kind of you know, encountered Paul. Now, scholars guess as to how did that happen, why did that go about. My suspicion is personally, um, because of Roman law, I think Onesimus went looking for Paul. Because Roman law had a provision, if a slave felt like he was being treated unjustly by his master, he could find somebody who was, had higher status than his master and to try to intercede on his behalf. So my guess is that, that the reason Onesimus and Paul connected is because Onesimus went looking for Paul and had heard stories and knew that Paul had some sort of leverage or authority over Philemon, his, his slave owner, which would suggest that Philemon hadn't been treating Onesimus very well, right? which is a problem which also explains why in Colossians there's more instructions about slaves and slave masters than in most other letters, but that's beside the point. Any case, any case, Onesimus connects with Paul. And while he's there, Paul realizes, man, we got a real issue here, but the biggest issue, Onesimus, is your own heart and soul before God. So Paul leads Onesimus to Jesus, and Onesimus becomes a Christian from Paul while Paul's in prison. Well, now they have a problem. What do we do with Onesimus? And what do we do with Philemon? And what do we do with their situation? Like, legally, Paul can't keep Onesimus. If he does, he's harboring a runaway slave. That just, you know, amplifies the charges against him, and he's already in prison. That's not going to go well, right? Besides that, Paul's already taught people that you got to obey the government. So now what do we do? And we, yeah, we're Christians, and now you're a Christian. Philemon's a Christian. And apparently, there are some issues here, so we got to sort this out. And so Onesimus... And Paul come up with a really high-risk strategy to try to embody the gospel in this messy situation. So why, why such a personal letter addressed to, you know, for the whole church? Why, why a personal letter between a slave owner named Philemon and his runaway slave named Onesimus? Why is that in your Bible? Why do you have this personal letter in your Bible? Why did... Why did the church think this was good for the whole church to hear? Well, you see, contrary to American individualism, you're not purely an individual. And the things you do don't just affect you. The choices you make don't just affect you, or even just you and those like immediately closest to you. The choices we make have a, a collective effect on the group of people we're a part of. And we all know this is true. Right? Like, uh, extended family affects what happens in your family, right? Uh, generations can affect down the line through generations. Our choices have a ripple effect that are far bigger than us as individuals. And as a church, it's not just, please hear this, it's not just about your personal relationship with Jesus. Your relationship with Jesus is personal, but it's not individual. Your relationship with Jesus is personal, but it's not individual. And the choices you make as a Christian have an impact on, an effect on the kind of people you become as Hill City Church. So who are you going to be as Hill City Church, right? That's why Paul wants it in... You know, the whole church to hear it, that's why it's in your Bible, because the gospel is so broad that it's for churches. 
and it's so specific, it's for you. And you're going to have to figure out how to work it out in your own relationships, in your own choices, in your own household, in your own family, in your own responsibilities. How are you going to live the gospel out right where you live in such a way that it flushes out Jesus and the gospel to the world all around you so that it forms God's people to be a city set on a hill that says we do relationships differently. We want to show you a different way of being human. Not slave owners and slaves and power and authority and I can do whatever I want with my property. No, we don't do that. We treat each other as family. We love each other differently. We'll use our power for the well-being of the powerless. We'll use our authority for the good of the needy. We'll use the relationships in our own household to build people up so that their character is formed in Christ not just to get my own way so that my economic status and my honor is advantaged in town. No, we're different, and we make choices differently in how we use our power, our authority, and how we do relationships, and it has to be case-specific. And so there's Philemon in your Bible.